Welcome, my name is, is Katrin Lai, and um, I'm heading up Fashion for Good. And Fashion for Good is an innovation platform, collaborative innovation, where we help startups to scale. And I hope you all had a look in this little booklet already, and hopefully already engaged with some of our innovators that are in the Innovation Forum, really amazing entrepreneurs from solutions in dyeing, to cut, make, trim, but also to new business models. And I'm extremely excited that I have the opportunity to moderate this panel, as we believe there is a huge opportunity in new business models to really close the loop in fashion. And no one better than this group of panelists um, that can help me address some of those challenging questions in this arena. So please welcome Jeff Denby from Renewal Workshop, Sebastian Fabre from Vestiaire Collective, Giulio Bonazzi from Aquafil, Bert Wouters from Procter Gamble, and Bill McDonough from McDonough Innovation. And I want to encourage all of you to please be actively involved. Submit your questions um, on your app. Scroll down in the menu to the session business models for a closed loop fashion system and please submit your questions. A bit of context for our discussion. In the CEO agenda that you all have in your bags, um, closed loop fashion systems has been listed as one of the four priorities for real um, transformational change in the industry. And I think we all know that um, there is a huge economic opportunity from moving from a linear model to a circular model. And whilst that case seems clear, circularity also has become a bit of a buzzword in the industry with little commitment for real change. So what we'd like to discuss here is how do we move from hype to real business, and we, with this amazing group of, of innovators who are all working on real scalable um, solutions, and together they cover the three key levers to really move to a circular setup. The first one with materials that are renewable and safe, second with business models that keep clothes in use, and as a third one turning use clothes into new ones. So, to kick us all off, let's start with, with Bill. Bill, you've, um, in 2005, you've created the Cradle to Cradle program, and you gave this to the public and to the C2C Institute in 2010, and all these ideas have, have, taken, um, have been taken forward, and you work now with some really renowned companies around the world, um, from Unilever to Procter Gamble to Walmart, and you also run MBDC with material health assessments. So can you help us, Bill, in getting um, our definition of circularity clear? How should we talk about it? What's, what's important when we think of a closed-loop fashion system? Right. Well, first, I think, Thank you, and thank everybody for being here. Um, this is one of the great conversations. So we have to remember that a closed loop, if we think of circular economy as, this, as the linear economy in a circle, we haven't really taken advantage of the moment. So I think the principles, and it's wonderful how many people have been able to work with this, is that we need to think of biological nutrition and technical nutrition. And let's not get them all mixed up in the one system. It really, we want to, in the future, understand certain things go back to nature, certain things go back to industry, and let's keep them from contaminating each other. So I think for a circular economy to be a virtue, we have to have goods and services, not bads and services. We need goods in the first instance. So let's design things that are good and then let's recirculate them. So I think for a truly powerful 
circular economy. We have biological and technical nutrition, and we design goods. And sometimes we design goods as services, especially if it's technical materials, because you have the service of the clothing, and then you put it back in a system and the service comes again. So the language of it becomes, instead of designing for end of life, when you think about that statement, I hope we don't succeed. <laughs> so end of life, we can apply to biological nutrition, but to technical especially, we should say end of use, because then we can design for next use, not end of life. We design for next use. So, so that, that means our design and our intention changes to become something that is, can foment growth and the children can be really happy. So it's really essentially renewably powered, the water is clean, lives are dignified. And it's essentially adults behaving with child supervision. Because <laughs> we worry about their generations <laughs> while we do our work. So thinking about... Yeah. The goods that were circulating. The good, yeah. You've, you're also the co-founder of Fashion for Good, and you've been here on stage last year mm -hmm. at the summit. So what happened since you last spoke? Oh, there's, there's <laughs> lots. Um, <laughs> across all kinds of industry sectors. But for us, one of the specific things that's been fun is watching the, the chemistry of Cradle to Cradle be engaged in the, in the industry. And we actually now have Cradle to Cradle Gold certified fabrics, uh, garments. Uh, and that means that people have taken it to heart and have gone all the way. Mm -hmm. and, and it's been beautiful to see. So we have, we have clothing that's renewably powered, 100%. Mills that are solar, mills that are wind, beautiful. We have uh, water coming out of a mill that's so clean because it's distilled water, it's evaporation. There's no water coming out of the mill except by evaporation. Think of that. So there's these multi-attribute qualities are now being thought of as we design. So it's not just single attribute. It's actually a world of good across sectors. And now we have evidence of it. Because as Leibniz said, if it is possible, therefore it exists. So our job is to make it exist. So it's possible. Yeah. Thank you. I want to move over to Julio talking about um, materials. With Aquafil, you've set up a unique regeneration system that creates the econil fiber out of waste from the oceans. Please share with us how your model looks like, how, you're crea how you've created this regenerative system. Well, differently than uh, others, we decided uh, to start from waste. So actually we take waste from all over the places, uh, like fish nets, uh, like uh, carpets, like the one that we are uh, standing uh, just uh, right now, or fabrics uh, or other type of waste. We take them back, we put them, uh, let's call it uh, in a magic box, because it's pretty complicated and I don't want to let you go asleep after, especially after lunch. And we produce Econil, which is a uh, a nylon fiber performing and uh, incredibly uh, identical to the one uh, coming from oil. Uh, we like to say that Econil is sustainable because we don't use uh, resources uh, from the planet but waste. We like to say that Econil is infinite because uh, it's not just one step recycling, which you know is good to recycle once, but uh, is something that can be uh, done an infinite number of times. It means that you give me this carpet, I give you the yarn to make uh, your swimwear, we give him back your swimwear and I uh, make uh, the yarn to make uh, your uh, jacket uh, or, uh, you know, uh, the material for your 3D printer that uh, you are going to have at home uh, very shortly. And we also like to say that it's endless because uh, being like uh, the one coming from oil, yeah. There are no limitations uh, for uh, designers, you know, they can really uh, work like uh, using uh, the virgin uh, nylon. It's really mm, just uh, the same. So it's a great uh, effort, but also uh, a lot of fun when you make uh, these kind of things, because you never know what you are getting when you take the waste uh, at home. And uh, the waste is coming from all over the world, for example, fishing nets, of course, from Scandinavia, you know that there is a big uh, uh, farming uh, 
fish farming industry, not only in Scandinavia, but Scotland and the Mediterranean, and believe it or not, uh, Pakistan, India, Far Eastern uh, countries. Sometimes they call us from Australia or uh, New Zealand. Next week I will be in Japan uh, organizing a net collection on the northern part of, of the Hokkaido Island. And this is one of our most important uh, stream of post-consumer uh, waste. Carpet uh, is the second uh, one, very important, because a lot of nylon in uh, carpets. And uh, you know, I was just uh, sharing with, uh, with him that we are now opening up uh, a second facility in Sacramento, really, to recycle uh, carpets. So for us, uh, waste uh, are not representing a problem, but uh, uh, is, uh, they are uh, a great opportunities. And uh, you know, it's uh, something, really, that uh, can create uh, value throughout the chain without uh, using uh, new resources uh, from the planet. Mm -hmm. And you've launched Econil in 2014. And we launched was... Econil in 2011. This was the very starting uh, day. Even if I must remember that uh, we started up the plant and in one week everything was broken, you know. So <laughs> for three months, uh, nothing was uh, moving. Then, you know, slowly we started to understand uh, how to uh, operate uh, uh, the plant. And you said that you probably you'd, you wouldn't have engaged in this endeavor if you would have known how complex well, this when is. So uh, you did what, are the, what was the most important challenge that you faced? Well, for sure to build uh, uh, the, uh, the supply chain, the reverse uh, logistic uh, system. Uh, today everything is uh, made uh, with the model of uh, taking uh, resources from the planet, making products and then uh, sending uh, products to landfill. Unfortunately, Products are not uh, made, or very little, uh, or very few, are made uh, with uh, the end in mind or the, or the next uh, uh, use, you know. We should learn more from nature, mm -hmm. where uh, everything is becoming a nutrient uh, for the next uh, step. Uh, and this is happening in, uh, in our case. But then, you know, many different challenges. I remember once they called me from our AKS uh, warehouse, any kind of shit, this is how we call it. Mm -hmm. It's really plenty of garbage uh, inside, and they called me and they said, Julia, we have to download a container. And OK, what's uh, the problem? There is one net. What? One single net in one container. Tell me how to take uh, uh, and discharge uh, one single net uh, out of a container, you know? So stupid uh, problems, but, uh, you know, you start mm. uh, trying to resolve uh, minor problems and then uh, slowly, step by step, uh, you try to develop uh, something which is really unique and uh, making uh, the difference. It's really a circular economy in, uh, in action, because this material uh, is really uh, recyclable uh, forever, an infinite mm. uh, number of times. So you can really design uh, your products, uh, you can send them back at the end of uh, use, and we can uh, give you the next uh, raw material for the next uh, generation mm. of products. Okay. So reverse logistics, a key Reverse challenge. logistics <laughs> is the first problem that you have uh, to solve. Then, of course, the technology, because, uh, uh, you know, if you think about uh, uh, a garment, a garment is not made, for example, uh, in one single uh, material or a mm. fabric. So you have to find a way to separate this garment uh, into the different uh, fibers if you want uh, really to regenerate uh, it. And this is not easy. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, our life would be tremendously easier if you guys uh, develop products uh, thinking uh, to the next uh, uh, use of this uh, material. And I'm sure you can. Uh, in our what would case, be a very specific call to action towards the brands and designers in, in the room with regards to making it easier for you from a recyclability perspective? Well, it depends how you design uh, your product. Uh, of course, uh, uh, you have to make beautiful products. If you don't make beautiful products, you will never sell them. No? <laughs> this is by mm -hmm. uh, definition. And uh, using Econil, you have no limitation. So you can use Econil like every virgin uh, nylon uh, mm -hmm. yams, or you can substitute uh, nylon instead of using polyester or other, uh, or other fibers, because uh, nylon is extremely performing. So depending how you engineer a garment, for example, using buttons made uh, out of uh, nylon, mm -hmm or linings made out of nylon, you make my life uh, much uh, easier. 
might cost much lower and so the possibility also to become more and more mm. competitive because uh, when you start uh, this kind of journey you are more expensive yeah but if you think uh, to re-engineer uh, the products and to re-engineer the value chain and to find a way to bring back uh, uh, products logistically in a competitive uh, way you can be extremely competitive mm -hmm. and so also the cost uh, limitation uh, could become uh, a cost opportunity. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So this is an, um, a really powerful example on how to keep materials in use and regenerate those. I want to um, move on now to um, Sebastian. Um, Sebastian, you, you've co-founded um, Vestia Collective and really built well, the leading online marketplace to buy and um, sell pre-owned designer clothing and accessories. And this is really a scalable business model, it seems, um, and the model that, that really keeps clothes in use. Can you share with us what inspired you when you started Vestiaire Collective? Almost seven years? How many years ago? Uh, nine years. Nine years ago. You can't imagine how, how scalable it is. I mean, uh, if you... Uh, in this morning session, we talk about traceability. Um, <clears throat> it's interesting to see how the products are product, and then where they are sold. But then, when the product is sold in a boutique, what happens after that? I mean, some people call it the gray market. We call it an undiscovered yet market. Imagine how it grows faster than the luxury good market. If you consider the 10 past years, um, 60% of the wardrobe is unworn. Uh, so it represents a volume of clothes that is uh, incredible. So what we decided to do is to activate all this sleeping supply and to, uh, you know, to enable this product, this beautiful product coming from you know, designer inspiration to have a second life, a third life, a fourth life, etc. So mm -hmm. our, our job was really to um, mix technology and fashion I'm sorry, I'm not from the fashion industry, but you know, I try to learn. <laughs> um, and the way we did that is first we, uh, we build a marketplace, and it's pretty important because you have countries and regions where you have the supply and countries where you have the demand. It's not the same countries. Sellers and buyers are not in the same countries. Um, and we, uh, we make sure that the, the supply side go faster than the, the demand side. And then we have a team of... Um, um, what we call the curators and people in our team that are stylists that select the product coming from the you know the, the individuals. The curation is very strong, meaning that we accept six thousand new products every day on the site. We reject thirty percent on top of that, but it's really curated product that we know that we're going to be able to sell. The beauty of the model is that the seller with an individual keep the product at his place until the product is sold. And when the product is sold, he sends it to us for free. And then we have a team of authenticators that come from auction houses. They are specialized in their, in their area, and they authenticate, control the product, and then we ship the product uh, to the final buyer. So it's, it's a pretty original uh, model. Um, but. Uh, I mean, we are at the beginning of the scale, definitely. So you've managed to bring liquidity in this, in this market um, by helping your sellers to know the right prices, provide for authenticity, and you merchandise it also beautifully. We've never seen ourselves as a, as a, a player of a parallel market. Mm. We really wanted to be a player that structure the secondary market and make sure that we can add value to that to onboard people, seller, buyer, but also to onboard the brand and the designers. Let me explain. I mean, I have many examples, but I'm going to focus on one. Uh, when Michele joined Gucci three years ago, something like that, mm -hmm. we had tons of Gucci loafers on the, uh, on the side, but we couldn't sell them. Um, but we could, with data, anticipated the fact that uh, you know, there will be a huge impact with, you know, Michele at Gucci. So we address the message to all the sellers, say, hey, can you, you know, sell your Gucci offers and will, you will have a good price. This is the trends and the value trend that you will see 
in the coming months, so please uh, put it for sale. And it was in incredible. I mean, we had like 600 pair of loafers uh, where they are unsold, uh, sorry, uh, un unavailable uh, in the boutiques. Mm -hmm. But on our site, we had 600 pairs of Gucci loafers with a value that has doubled uh, in a week. Mm -hmm. We sold them in uh, less than three weeks. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really about that, how you mix the data, make sure that you can have, you know, the overtime value of product, but also the desirability of product. Mm -hmm. And you mix the two curves and you see, OK, people want this product in this region, now you can sell them. Uh, it's really about that for me. I think you mentioned 85% of your sales is cross-border. Yeah, that's it's interesting. increasing dramatically. You know, we have sometimes the same product to circulate three or four times on our platform mm -hmm. because what is fashionable in France will be fashionable in the UK, blah, 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 etc. Et so it's, it's, you know, it's a perpetual motion. Mm -hmm. But you have to use the data to... Uh, yeah. to and how that. do you work with brands? With many brands here in the audience. What is the your way question. of collaborating? Hmm. Uh, how do we work with them? We work with them um, since the beginning, actually. We have signed an anti-counterfeit charter with all the brand and designers. Um, and they help us authenticate the product. Sometimes we help them to uh, uh, culturally understand the product that they have sold 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a very interesting and, and constructive collaboration. Then we discuss with brand and designer on the data side, obviously, because uh, and it was very really interesting. What, what's, you know, what matters for a product is not the, the price that you sell it as new, but what is the lifetime value of the product? I mean, you sell it uh, one time at 2,000 euros, but then on the resale market, it's going to increase, and you're going to resell it at 160 euros, and then you're going to resell it at 100. And so if you take all the lifetime value, and you have to consider that to make sure that you produce at the right price, and, and then that you understand really what matters at the end of the day. Mm. So it's the type of collaboration we have with brand and designers. Perfect. Another wonderful example to keep products in use um, is what Jeff is doing with the, with the renewal workshop. And while Sebastian's model with Vestia Collective focuses on peer-to-peer -peer selling, you're focusing on, on um, this idea of remanufacturing and really embracing this idea of perpetual use with a different starting point, mostly you work with brands. Can you share how your, your model works? Yeah, exactly. So what we do is uh, we work with brands to help them restore the value of their unsellable returns in their excess inventory and damaged product. Um, so that's what the Renewal Workshop was set up to do, was really to enable brands um, to access the market, the re-commerce market, and own that themselves and essentially create a circular economy uh, for their own business. Um, so the way we do that is we built a factory uh, outside of Portland, Oregon. So yes, we built a apparel factory in America, uh, sort of. Um, we, uh, when you work, when a brand works with us and partners with us, they send us all of their damaged product, unsellable returns, the um, warranty product, and then anything that they might acquire through a take-back strategy. Uh, so we get that product that just arrives at our factory, and um, we developed a whole system for sorting that product, um, barcoding that product, identifying every single product. We uh, grade it, we clean it all using liquid CO2 cleaning technology, and then we can repair anything that might be wrong with that product. And we essentially create this whole new category called renewed apparel. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't, we're not upcycling or downcycling, we're not changing the product, we're really trying to restore this product to its original design and functionality intent. So. This is your Apple refurbished or your pre-certified or certified pre-owned sort of used vehicle, but for apparel. Mm -hmm. um, and then through our technology um, and systems, we're able to create the uh, selling system for the brand as well. And so um, we'll develop a white labeled uh, website, an e-commerce store uh, for the brand so that they can own the customer interaction and the the customer relationship um, and the acquisition 
uh, of in the sale, but we manage the whole back end for them. Um, we deal in single SKU product and management of all of that data associated with the, the product, and we can do the 3PL, the, like the fulfillment for mm -hmm. the brand. So it really becomes this uh, turnkey solution where we're taking product that, this is product that typically builds up in warehouses in the back of retail stores that's dirty, missing a button, broken hems, things that brands can't sell as top first tier product. And the reality is, is the majority of this stuff is shredded and sent to landfill. And we're taking that product, putting it through a whole system that's it's, it's worth zero at that point, and then allowing the brand to sell it for and actually get revenue out of this product and a margin. And in the case of a take back strategy, now a brand can send us all the product they can possibly collect from consumers, which they've already sold once, Mm. put it through a renewal system, and then sell it again to a customer. So now we're growing revenues for a brand without having to make new products. We're act helping brands access new customer. We call this customer the renewed customer, someone who's looking for to buy less mm. or to participate <laughs> in this kind of sort of new way of, of purchasing. And so that, we're really an, a, a service pro provider that really enables brands um, to participate and develop this kind of business model. So from an economic perspective, brands can make multiple margins of that, on that product. Exactly, that's and that's, an that's the key thing is, you know, when, when you, this is about looking at your product and your business in a slightly different way, and instead of just a single margin, you're actually going to make a system margin on a product. Mm -hmm. And so if you're thinking about a, the margin on your product is connected to the second sale and maybe the third sale, mm -hmm then you can start to think differently about product design and sourcing because you know you're not just relying on one single margin um, out of that product. And you're going to access multiple customers mm -hmm. and different kinds of customers when you start to bring them in. And so um, it's been a really exciting journey. We've been, uh, the factory's been operating for two years now and we've got a number of brands in the US, um, mostly in the uh, outdoor industry and in a month, we'll be launching a multi-billion dollar uh, brand's renewed apparel um, program, which is really exciting to see a, a large company take on the transition to a circular business model and really start to be like, this is how we're going to grow revenues, not from making new things and mm -hmm. selling new things. So what's next for you in terms of scaling your, your operations? Yeah, I think what's really interesting is that we've discovered that what we developed in, uh, in Portland is essentially a, a template factory and that uh, we will go and create renewal facilities around the world that are located close to where a brand's distribution center might be. We can minimize transportation um, and then really service uh, those brands. And mm -hmm. so um, we have a number of uh, mostly uh, American brands in our pipeline, but we are really interested in finding the right anchor brand in Europe who wants to take on Renewed. So and, this is the um, call to action. Any <laughs> yeah. European-based brands, please connect with them. Come talk, Jeff. yeah. I mean, for us, it really is about having an anchor brand with the volume, and then it's about setting up that renewal facility and mm -hmm. really en enabling that brand to own the re-commerce of their own product in, in the in the market it was designed for. Perfect, thank you. Bert, you, <laughs> yeah, applause for Jeff. <laughs> so Bert, you work with Procter & Gamble and you're in charge of the fabric enhancer business globally. And you're addressing the use phase of garments and really pointing out that this is a a phase that has been or overlooked, um, and there is a huge impact Absolutely. that we as consumers also have in terms of how we treat and take care of our clothes. Absolutely. Yes, it's very encouraging from our side to see that the use phase is becoming more and more part of the discussion uh, when it comes down to circularity in fashion. Before, historically speaking, it was always about make take and dispose, it was about sourcing production mm -hmm. and it was about disposal, recycling uh, of clothes. Um, at this point in time, it's really good to see that we're starting to talk more and more and more about what happens to clothes as we use them. To build on uh, Bill's point, mm -hmm. 
the good stuff that we have created, we want to keep it good. And we want to keep it good for longer and longer and longer. Mm -hmm. Because that is something that would have an amazing impact on the, uh, on the environment as well. Um, we've seen a lot of studies coming out recently that actually are telling us that maybe the use phase and extending the active life of clothes might actually have even the biggest impact uh, when it comes down to waste, carbon and, uh, and uh, uh, water impacts. So it's really important we spend a lot of time on that. And as a fabric care company, PNG, we are obviously very interested in this phase. And we've recently done some testing um, that has actually revealed something very interesting. And we've called it our Ariel and Lenore long live fashion formula or long live fashion routine. And actually, Lenore, this Lenore long live fashion. The Ariel Lenore okay. long live mm -hmm. fashion mm -hmm. formula or long live fashion routine mm -hmm. is actually three steps of washing. And if we could convince every consumer to wash that way, we could really significantly extend the life of clothes. And I'll quickly explain what that means. Um, first and foremost, it's proven um, technically that when you use a high quality liquid detergent or when you use a, a unidose detergent like the aerial pots that we mm -hmm. have launched a number of years ago, when you use that, when you combine that with a cold cycle and with a quick cycle uh, in washing, and then you complement that, you finish that off with using a fabric conditioner like Lenore, uh, sometimes also called Downy in the US for mm -hmm. us, uh, when you use that regimen, you can actually extend the life of clothes by 4x. By 4x. So you can really keep your clothes four times longer than if you would not be using that, if you would be using a lower quality detergent. And the environmental impact of that is just amazing, it's just humongous. Um, we've made some studies and we've worked together with some uh, European agencies uh, to calculate what the impact of that would be. Mm. And actually, it turns out that if we would just take one out of five garments and we would keep that all for 10% longer than we do today, that actually would have an impact of a reduction of 3 million tons of carbon. Um, it would save 150 million liters of water mm. and it would actually keep 6.4 million tons of garments uh, out of landfill. Mm. So that's how we want to contribute and how we believe that, you know, uh, with, with putting a lot of emphasis on the use phase and keeping the good mm -hmm. for longer, that actually we can make a significant impact on the, on the environment. Well, thank you. Three easy steps for all Absolutely. of us to remember. So Absolutely. quick and cold cycles and liquid. Correct. And, and the conditioner. conditioner. Absolutely. Not, not to forget. Um, there was quite a discussion around a microfiber release. Can um, those solutions, this three-step formula, also address microfiber release to Absolutely. some extent? Absolutely. Um, the, the discussion around microfibers has been a big discussion and has been sometimes mm -hmm. a bit of a confusing discussion. Um, however, the data we have around microfibers is that, again, washing in cold and washing in quick and using a liquid detergent definitely helps to reduce um, the shedding of microfibers, the release of microfibers. It's actually pretty obvious when you think about it. Um, the more you put a garment to spin in a machine, the more friction there is, the more interaction there is with uh, with, with harsh products, the more, of course, mm. microfibers will get released. So that's the immediate impact that you get when you start washing, again, when you take the, the, yeah. the formula that we have just uh, talked about. Uh, that's the immediate impact. But then the second impact, which is an indirect impact, is maybe even more important. And that impact, again, comes from extending the life of clothes. What is interesting to know is that new garments in the first six to seven washes actually shed the majority of the microfibers. Mm -hmm. So the longer you keep your garments, the less microfibers are going to be released in the subsequent washing that happens you know, as you keep that garment for longer. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, I have a couple of questions coming up here. And um, I think one of this question, well, lends itself to Bill, but I think also for the others um, to contribute. When some circular models include repurposing post-consumer textiles, which may have been manufactured using harmful chemicals, how do we combat the risks of circularity perpetuating the use of toxic textile ingredients? Who wants to take this? <laughs> Challenging question. Thank you for submitting this. This is an interesting one, obviously. 
the, it, it comes up also in the ocean plastics because as we talk about cleaning up, we end up with this, this undefined system that has all these various characteristics. So some of the things that we're seeing that are potential are various processes which are purification rituals actually. They're in upcycling. So we're starting to see that in, the, in chemical recycling. For example, we can take materials and then put them through various systems, including pyrolysis, and then purify them, because we can take out the sludges with the nasties, and then we end up with a pure material, and we can put that back into commerce. So the way I think we're gonna be looking at it typically is what are the potentials for danger, what are the potentials for upcycling, and look at it as a, as a whole system analysis. And the thing about toxics is they're really about dose and duration, and a toxin is a material in the wrong place at the wrong dose and duration. So the, the first cut, which is the, that part of it, would be to look for care in that space. But ultimately, I think the precautionary principle is what we all want, which is let's not produce this in the first place, and let's figure out how to use marking systems over time. So I think as we look at when we hear about recycling nylon or things like that, with the blockchain coming, I think we're gonna want to know what everything is, where it is, what its characteristics are. That's why I think that, um, that what we're doing at Passion for Good is we've got this, we've taken all the assessments that were done on the chemicals and everything and we're putting it open source. Everybody can go there and see all the processes that were used to create a good thing. And it's all available. So it's that sharing. And I think that's what we're gonna have to do now is just share a lot of information and. People here as brands are competitive. And I think the marvelous thing about what we can all do together here is instead of having competitive advantage only, we can have cooperative advantage, which is a different approach because we'd all start cooperating with these different business models. And the open source is a really important part of that, the transparency. So one of the ways we can deal with this information is have the information. And it is frightening what we see. We see it in packaging, we see it in textiles, these miscellaneous materials. I don't know what the designers were thinking, because why would they make something like that? I don't know. I'm just an innocent, I guess. But the, the key here is to change the thinking from resources to relationships. When you hear about talking about these materials that come back, you're in a relationship with the customer. Whenever somebody uses resources, I always think, what if I substitute the word relations? If I have a human resources department, and I say human relations. If I say natural resource department, what about natural relations? And in this case, we're talking about economic relations. You're, you're in a relationship with the customers. Mm -hmm. And it's that relationship that has the value. So then the question is, how do you provide them with a good? So this question, is really serious because up to now, we, could, we haven't been well behaved. So. If, Thank you. If I can also yeah. say something, uh, there is a big difference between mechanical recycling and chemical recycling. Sorry again after lunch uh, to you know, take, uh, you engage there with these technical things. When you recycle mechanically something, you keep inside uh, the toxic materials uh, that were maybe used 10 or 20 years ago. A carpet, uh, luckily a garment, thanks to these people, may last uh, not uh, one season, uh, but maybe 10 mm -hmm. or 20 years. But you know, in 10 or 20 years, uh, the society can recognize that a material that was not considered as toxic or dangerous is become, has become something which is harmful for uh, the healthiness of the people. So this is something that uh, uh, we have to consider. In the chemical recycling, Perfect. as Bill uh, knows what we are doing, uh, you take out all uh, what is uh, non-nylon, uh, non-participating uh, to the molecule mm -hmm. that we are uh, regenerating, and in this, at this point, actually, we purify the, the material. So Perfect. it's uh, something that is representing, for sure, uh, the future of... Uh, With chemical recycling. Yes, of it's recycling. Part of Excellent. Upcycling. Yeah. So we have... Um, 50 seconds left, <laughs> but I want to close with one final question because we are all about scaling those new, new business models and really transitioning to a circular system. What do you think, from your perspective, is the biggest roadblock to scale and how to, to overcome this, starting with, with Jeff? Uh, well, to go back to something that Bill was just talking about, it's the data. And really, when we get a Garmin, all we have is the information that's on the little white tag and the style number, and that's 
But if we're going to look at garments as having multiple lives, those garments have to come to us with the information about where it was made, what it's truly made of, what was the original price, the features and benefits. Mm -hmm. All that can be embedded in data, blockchain technology. And so thinking about when you manufacture something at the beginning, that it's going to have multiple lives mm -hmm. and other providers are going to access the data on this garment. So we're looking at this as a closed loop circular system, not just like a linear selling system. Mm -hmm. So thinking about how you can embed data in your products is going to enable you in the future to grow revenues through circular systems. Thank you. So data for perpetual use. Sebastian. I would say to inject uh, the resale value uh, of a product in people's mind when they buy a new product in a boutique because they, you know, they will buy uh, probably easier mm -hmm. uh, and you know, they will resell at the end of the day. So. Also relates to data and technology for mm -hmm. further use phases. Exactly. Well, for me, uh, Econil is born with uh, the end uh, in mind. We need designers to design products uh, with the end uh, 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 thinking at the end of the use, as well as consumers to buy products uh, thinking what is happening next, you know. So mm. to select uh, what are the products that can represent uh, the next generation uh, or the future uh, nutrient for the new generation of products uh, instead of uh, simply something to use and then to dispose. Mm -hmm. Designed with that in mind? Yes. Belt. I think there are many challenges still to scale it up, but I'll take the vantage, the vantage point here from uh, as a consumer goods company. Mm -hmm. I think in the end, it is all, it's very important to change the consumer behavior. Today, the consumer thinks about more is better, and I think we need to try to educate the consumer that it is about less is more. Mm -hmm. So how do we get to that kind of thinking? Uh, yeah. How, how do we get to more responsible consumption? Mm -hmm. We buy less, we care for it better, and because we care for it better, we can keep it for longer. And that, in the end, um, is going to take time, it's going to take resources, and it's going to take partnerships. But that's where we as a company, as Procter & Gamble, we want to contribute, because in the end, we touch consumers, 5 billion consumers every, every day uh, with our products. So mm -hmm. that's where we believe we can make a big difference on building the awareness of what the impact is of you know, fashion on the environment, and then offering real tangible solutions. And again, we believe that if we can tell consumers that they can extend their life of their clothes four times, think about what that does to the wallet of consumers. They will have to spend less on buying new clothes and renewing clothes all the time. And that gives them a deep incentive as well to become part of the circular mm -hmm. economy. So, consumer awareness along Absolutely. less is more. Consumer awareness, consumer education, mm -hmm. and convincing them that there is value for them in extending the life of their clothes mm -hmm. and participating in this circular economy. Thank you. Bill, final words. We're over time, be, <laughs> so we need to keep it very short. I'll try. <laughs> um, being less bad is not being good. It's being bad by definition, just less so. <laughs> so, <laughs> less is a mathematical relationship, it's Aristotle. Bad is a human value. So if we only start with value, numbers, we can get to tactics, strategies, and goals. We start with number, less, more. But where we're going and where this group is going, seems to me, is toward the values and we start with the values because that's Plato. That is the search for truth and the search for beauty. That is ethics, that is morals. What is the right thing to do? Not just the right way to do something. Because if we're doing the wrong thing perfectly, we become perfectly wrong. So the question becomes, what is the right thing to do? What is truth and what is beauty? So this data search is part of our search which is data-oriented, which is the less and the more. This is statistical significance. This is artificial intelligence. This is the blockchain. Fine. But these are tools. But to what purpose? What is our intention as a species? And so the reason I'm here, and I'm excited about being here, is that you are looking for the search for truth and beauty. And one of the most amazing things I ever heard from a mathematician and physicist was Murray Gell-Mann when he won the Nobel Prize for discovering the quark gets up on stage and says the following. We have discovered in theoretical physics that the more and more beautiful a mathematical formula appears, the more and more likely it is true.
Many thanks to all of you for those final words. And please all join me in thanking this panel. Thank you.